Hello everyone, my name is Sam and let's start this webinar. What you need to know about exposure monitoring. So when you call us and you ask for whether or not you need air monitoring or exposure monitoring or you've been given an improvement notice by WorkSafe, this is the information that us as occupational hygienists need to find out from you so we can get this monitoring done. So we need a lot of information that helps us provide accurate quotes and get actually get what you need in the end to help the workers reduce their health and safety risks. So we need to know the substances and processes used on site, the number of workers in relevant areas, the health effects experienced by the workers, current controls on site, the shift length and patterns of the workers, and just general health and safety requirements on site. So all of this is to determine help us determine what we're going to monitor for, how we're going to monitor, because there are sometimes are multiple methods of monitoring for the same substances. Um, what hazards on site are going to be there for us, how many people we need to monitor for, um, and we'll get into that in much more detail later, because uh, sample numbers are appropriate. The length of time we'll need to be on site for and to monitor for those various shift lengths or patterns. And what may seem like pretty um, low key information like do they work an eight hour or 12 hour shift can really change the um, exposure level of the worker and our potential monitoring strategy. So that's why we need to know it. Another key bit, the health effects. Just because you're using, I don't know, let's say formaldehyde on site, um, that, that is in itself quite hazardous, but maybe something with the process you're using that chemically reacts to form something even more hazardous. And the health effects may be different to those of that original formaldehyde and more of the reaction product. So by knowing what health effects are experienced by the workers, it can help us narrow down on what actually might be the, the agent causing the harm to the workers. And one of the main things we get all this information for is to determine similar exposure groups or SEGs. So similar exposure groups, these are groups of workers who have similar work patterns or processes and exposure hazards. So this allows us to measure a subset of workers and make recommendations for the larger group. Because exposure monitoring, unfortunately, is expensive and we want to be as cost effective as possible for you guys. So rather than monitoring everyone, which we'll get to later, which is the ideal, we can monitor a smaller group of these people and make recommendations for the whole. Workers can be di in different SEGs depending on the types of hazard. And for example here, we've got supermarket workers. So you think, oh yeah, go to your local supermarket, they all work at the supermarket, they've all got the same, um, same exposure. But if we consider the noise levels of people at a supermarket, so we've got checkout workers, well, yeah, they're, apart from the beeps of the um, items as they go through the scanners, they're not really in the chat with the customers, they're not really exposed to that much. Then we have the, or what we call SEG2 in this case, let's say the workers in the deli and the bakery. You know, bit different exposure, they're now using uh, machines, cutting machines, wrapping machines, all, all these things to prepare the products that we like to eat. Um, so they've got some more high noise elements there. And we've got a third sec, the people at night that come in and fill the shelves. Well, they're probably dealing with forklifts and pallet jacks and all those other items outside. Also, the shop isn't um, operational when they're going, so there's probably no more music and no customer noise. So they've all got different, um, they're all in different similar exposure groups. And we can monitor a subset of each of those groups to determine the risk for the whole. And then we can collect that all and information for the whole company. Now sample numbers, this is often what we get uh, pushback from clients about. Oh, how come you can't just do one sample? Well, you'll see here, it's a bit more complicated than that. We're trying to figure out what the true exposure is of the workers, but exposure varies day to day. In an ideal world, with price and time and everything wasn't a issue, we'd monitor every worker every day and we'd be able to figure out what their true exposure is, but that's just not practical. So we use methods to statistically estimate what true exposure is with much more limited sample numbers. Some of those methods include EN689, which is the method we primarily use here at Chem Safety. Uh, we'll go into detail on that in a bit. Um, got the NIOSH 1977 guidance, uh, and that's this table you see here. So basically, if your similar exposure group is less than 11 people, then you have to monitor for everyone. And even then, when you've got 
a group of 50 people, you have to monitor still 21 of them. So that's you know, roughly 40% of the workforce. And then as you tend towards larger groups, you have to monitor 29 people. And that should give you a reasonable estimate, estimation with you know, reasonable degrees of uncertainty about what the true exposure is for that group of people. We also have the AIHA, or the American Industrial Hygiene Association's guidance, which is six to 10 samples should be sufficient to estimate the exposure for a bit various exposure groups. So all that's a bit confusing, and that's why these are in the realm of hygienists as opposed to just general information here. Uh, EN689 varies uh, depending on what level of statistical proof you're after, but measurements can be anywhere between three and I guess infinity samples um, per exposure group. But we tend to go three to six, um, and we'll get into that in a wee bit of time. So, you know, why don't we just take one sample? Well, here is an example of what um, exposure can vary over time. So over here, we've got 50 different measurements. Now, the exposure standard I've just set here to be 100. And as you can see, we've got exposures all over the place. Um, you know, most are below the exposure standard, but we still have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 samples above. So over those 50 days, 14 of them, they were above the exposure standard and therefore at potential harm, um, whereas a lot of the time they're below it. So what is their true or normal exposure? Well, if we do some, oops, if we do some stats here, um, and I've worked out the average of all these different values here, we get it down here at around 70. So you know, the average exposure, if we did 50 measurements, we'd do some statistical analysis and we'd find out that you know, their true exposure is around this green line here. Now, however, you know, 50, 50 measurements is very impractical and be a large time consuming and costly exercise. So in practice, we don't get to do these sort of um, analyses. So what we use is these other assessment techniques, the EN689, the uh, NIOSH standard, or the AIHA standard, and we take subset measurements. So let's say we just took three measurements, so the first three samples here. You know, looking at those, if we average them out, we're probably gonna be above the exposure standard. And as we know, our true thing is much lower than that, somewhere around the 70 mark. If we took a different three samples on a different set of data, all right, well, those, those are a bit lower overall than this red batch here. So maybe this is getting it true. But how do we know which three samples are um, you know, a good representation of true? So ideally, the more samples, the better, but we understand that this is a um, costly exercise. So with EN689, um, we have two tests. We have the preliminary test and the statistical test to determine compliance. So if we have only three samples, which is the smallest number we can start doing this assessment with, then all three samples have to be below 10% of the exposure standard, so somewhere down here. And as you can see, there's not many chunk uh, groups of three samples that are below that number um, to be certain it's compliant. Because if we get three down here, then the chances are that we're not gonna have too many up this way. Um, if we have four samples, then we only need them to be below 15% of the exposure standard. And if we have five, they only need to be below 20% of the exposure standard. Now, once we get six samples or more, the stats start to be a bit more relevant and we can do a statistical analysis. And then it determines on whether the um, geometric mean of the, the samples is below the upper confidence limit, but we won't get into that today. So, personal sampling versus static sampling. We get a lot of times, oh, how come you can't just put a couple of static monitors in? So, I'm just going to try and explain that here. So, personal monitoring can be compared to the workplace exposure standards. So, these are the guidelines that we use to determine whether someone is um, at risk or not. And we can't compare, um, we're not allowed to compare static samples to the workplace exposure standards. Workplace exposure standards are deemed to be measured around the worker's breathing zone. So that's a 300 um, millimeter hemisphere from the center of the face. So extending from the, between the eyes and heading out. Um, whereas static can just be placed on a desk over there and it's not really effective of what I'm breathing. It's the air over there and that's different to the air that I'm breathing. 
and personal monitoring, it has its variation anyway, because workers are different heights, they work at different rates, um, they have individual techniques, which are different to each other. And even the same worker, day after day after day, will have a variation in exposure, whether weather conditions, fatigue, tiredness, just little changes in technique or concentration of the substance, it will vary the exposure over time. So that's why personal monitoring is the, is the gold standard. Static sampling in some situations can be useful to determine background levels and if control measures have been affected in reducing background, measure, background levels. But to do this, we need pre and post sampling for those control measures. One of those benefits of static samples is they can be placed anywhere. They don't have to be within that reaving zone of the worker. But once again, this should be decided by the occupational hygienist in um, collaboration with the client, but to making sure we're getting what we actually need to cover. Because yes, it can be a burden or inconvenience for the worker wearing the personal monitoring gear, but it is going to be much more accurate in determining what their personal exposure is. So we go on to interpreting the results. In the end of the day, we get a number, but it's not just as simple as is that number good or bad. So what is safe and what is compliant? And are they necessarily the same thing? So it's not quite as simple as being above or below the workplace exposure standard. So if we go back to our example earlier where the workplace exposure standard is 100, if I'm at 99, am I suddenly safe, whereas 100 I was unsafe? Not really, it's more or less the same degree of hazard. So just because you're above or below the line doesn't really change the thing. So in a general rule of thumb, if the, if the line's set up at 100, we really, or at any number really, we want to be taking actions if we get above 50% of that limit, because sometimes you'll be over it if you're at that point there due to that random variation we were talking about earlier. So if we're getting measurements above 50%, we really want to be introducing control measures to make sure we don't get any higher. You know, measurements between 25 and 50% of the standard, we want to be making sure we're tightening our controls, maybe reviewing them now and then, um, and keeping a close eye on it. And measurements sort of below 25%, maybe, maybe then you can start to be confident that you're, you're safe in regards to it. Now, the reason we have those sort of factors there is because workplace exposure standards are designed to protect most workers, not all workers. You know, everybody has their own different susceptibility to different things. You may hear those stories of people that smoke a pack a day all their lives and they die, die peacefully in their late age, um, no issues with lung cancer or any of the other smoking health effects. Whereas you find other people that may have smoked, you know, one or two cigarettes for a couple, a week, a couple years of their life pretty early on, and they die of lung or throat cancer. Um, we all have our own individual susceptibility. So the workplace exposure standards are designed to protect most, but not all. That's why it's not a fine line between safe and unsafe. To prove compliance, you need that multiple measurements. That's why we were talking about the sample numbers earlier in this presentation. If we just have one sample, you can't really say that you're compliant with the standard because it's below it. As we know, there's that variation. Um, and if the standard is out of date, it takes a lot of time to review and implement these standards. So if the new knowledge um, information, some of these substances have a long time, such as asbestos, to develop health effects. So we may, for a new substance, it may slowly, the standard may slowly decrease over time as we realize how hazardous it is. So you, if it's been a while since that standard's been reviewed, you may technically be compliant, you know, all your measurements are below 10% of the standard, but that standard is out of date. Um, you might not necessarily be safe. So that's where that expert opinion, we can go and look at the literature that's out there and try to determine whether or not your workers are safe, as well as being compliant with any legal standards that are out there. So we get this information and what do we do with it? How do we help you reduce your exposure? Wherever possible, we go to these hierarchy of controls. You've all heard them before. Elimination, substitution, isolation, engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. With the most effective being at the top of this inverted pyramid and the least effective being at the bottom of this inverted pyramid. So elimination, you know, physically removing the hazard from the thing. Um, let's say we were doing, um, ooh, I don't know. We were making uh, silica bench top, uh, engineered stone bench tops. They have a high, quite high crystalline silica hazard. So, eliminate it. We just decide. All right, we're no longer going to use elimination. Uh, we're no longer going to make engineered stone bench tops. It's just not a thing. 
So that's a limited hazard, we'll go find a new business and fix it. That's not normally practical, so we don't normally go down that route, but sometimes that is the only option. In that same situation, we could substitute. So deciding rather than using engineered stone bench tops, which have that high silica content, we're gonna use granite or um, marble bench tops that have a much lower silica content. All right, that's substitution, that's replacing the hazard. Other forms of substitution can be, it's using the same product, but in a different form. So rather than a dusty dry powder that can be quite a dust hazard, we're gonna use it in a pellet form, which means it's all bound up a little bit more and the dust hazard reduces. Isolation, this is separating the hazard from the worker, whether it be through distance, time, or physical barriers. It might be that that hazardous process only takes place first thing in the morning, um, you know, that person comes in early, does it between like 5 and 6 a.m. and the rest of the workers come in at 8 a.m., 9 a.m. and it's, it's had time to dissipate and uh, be removed from the atmosphere. It's no longer a hazard at that point. Or you, you know, build a separate wee workshop out the back of the yard and that's where that hazardous process is done. Engineering controls. So these are, whether it's local exhaust ventilation, physical barriers, somewhat with isolation or other forms of engineering control. Um, physical engineering interventions to try and reduce the exposure. Could be automation as well. Um, administrative controls. So these are your policies, your procedures, etc. Things you can do to change how the people work. Um, whether it be job rotation or um, extending rest breaks to give the people to recover. For example, carbon monoxide exposure. Um, you recover best or heat. Uh, with those breaks where you get the fresh air or the chance to cool down and then you can go back in it again. Um, you know, it's your SOPs, it's your training, your procedures, your programs you have in place, all that it comes under administrative control. And then finally, PPE. This is your last line of defense. If this fails, you're being exposed. So this is why it's our last resort because it is the least effective. So this is your respirators, your gloves, your overalls, things like that. So some common controls we see on site. A lot of these substances, a lot of the exposures we see out there, they can be controlled by some general um, categories out there, whether it be local source ventilation. So this is extraction that is happening um, basically at the source. Any control that's happening at the source is gonna be more effective than controls that happen at the pathway. So between the source and the person and more effective than controls that are happening at the person. If we can contain it over at the start, um, it's not even going to get to us personally, so we're not going to be exposed to it. Um, job rotation. So, uh, you know, if there's a process that, you know, it is hazardous, but if you get time to recover in between shifts, the body has a natural way of getting rid of it and reducing your exposure levels. So rather than one person doing that same hazardous job all day, every day, you've got 10, 12 people in your company that can do it. So you rotate. You only have to do it every half a day, every week and you don't go near the stuff the rest of the time, therefore reducing the overall harm and the hazard. It's gonna be suitable for some substances and not suitable for others, and that's why you need us to come and help you make those decisions. Health monitoring. This is one of those more administrative backstop controls. So we're doing monitoring and we've seen if there's been any physiological changes in the human body to these substances. If we start seeing something or a trend that's going in the wrong direction, we need to review our controls and make sure we're protecting them properly and we can remove that person from the job before things start to get any worse. Changing the form of the product. So this is where we went uh, substitution control, as I said earlier, rather than a dry powder, we can try adding the product in a palletized form, therefore reducing the dust hazard. Another way we commonly reduce dust hazards and some other ones is water misting. So you sometimes see it on those big road working sites, they have the water truck going to suppress the dust, same, same principle here. If the water droplet is of a similar size than a dust particle, it can take it out of suspension in the air and make it precipitate down to the ground. Enclosures, pretty simple one. We build a barrier around it so it's not in the same airspace as the rest of the workers. PPE, it's probably the most common one, unfortunately. It's the least effective, as I said earlier. But this is your respiratory protection, your safety glasses, your gloves, your overalls, safety boots, all those sort of things you see on TV. And then finally, we've got periodic reassessment. So we need a repeat exposure monitoring for a few reasons, but the main thing being situations change. Nothing is ever the same. Whether it 
even if you've got all your policies and procedures in place and the task is identical to what it was five years ago, it's probably that, yeah, you know, with all the wear and tear and if things haven't been maintained properly, your extraction may not be working as well as it did five years ago. The technique of the worker may have gotten a little sloppy or due to, you know, age or new worker, different height of the worker, they've been changed to different exposures than previously. Um, we also have recommendations on how to change, uh, how frequently we should do exposure monitoring based off the previous results. So this again is taken from the EN 689, which is a European standard on exposure monitoring. Um, in simple terms, these are a average of the results of the exposure monitoring. It's not a true average, there's statistical analysis here, um, but that's not something we need to get into today. So if all your results are below a tenth of the exposure standard, then it recommends that repeat monitoring should be done every 36 months. So, you know, that's not particularly long, every three years. Um, doesn't take long for that to roll around again. If your average of your results was between a tenth and a quarter of the exposure standard, then we're looking at 24 months between um, exposure monitoring intervals. If it's um, between a quarter and a half of an exposure standard, that average, in every 18 months, if it's greater than half of the exposure standard every 12 months, and obviously if it's above the exposure standard, as soon as you've got control measures in place to make, we've got to test their effectiveness and make sure it gets down to below the exposure standard, and you can start working there on reducing it even further as part of that elimination harm minimization goal that we all have. So yeah, thank you for watching or attending this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. We have a great team here that can answer all sorts of weird and wonderful um, queries that we get through to us. So contact us on the details you see there. Um, these are some of the other services we provide. So chemical consultancy, oc hygiene, asbestos, training services and hazardous substances and asbestos, um, hazardous substance consultancy as well. So yeah, feel free to contact us. We are more than happy to help.